the TV quiz contest. We're going to ask you a question that's centered all around the show since this is our anniversary today. We would like to know if you remember who the first three members of the Morning Exchange cast were. 578-0550, that's the contest line, never changes. And if you know the three names, now remember we need three answers, we have four Morning Exchange mugs for you. This is the first time that we've ever given that away as a prize in honor of the anniversary. Okay, now remember, we want the first three members of the Morning Exchange cast. Good morning. Do you know the answers? Yeah, Fred Griffith, Joel Rose, and Liz Richards. Nope. <laughs> not, not from the very first day. January 3rd, 1972, I think, was the date. Hello. Hi, Alan Douglas and um, Joel Rose. And I think it was you, Liz. <laughs> no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I came about three months afterwards. Hello. Alan Douglas, you, you, Liz, and uh, who's the third one? Joe Rose. No, you've got two out of three. I was not here on the first show. I came three months later. Hello? Is it Alan Douglas, Joe Rose, and Don Webster? You've got it. Yep, that's exactly right. Alan Douglas, Joel Rose, and Don Webster. And Don would stand right in about the place where I am and announce the show at the very beginning. That was his job. <laughs> that's about the extent of it. Okay, we've got four morning exchange mugs for you. What's your name? Yeah. Excuse me? John. Don? John. John. Okay. John, hold the line, okay? Because we want to get your full name and address. Thanks for calling. Okay. Four morning exchange mugs. And I guess you all got them. Alan Douglas, Don Webster, and Joel Rose. And that's it with the TV quiz contest. We're going to be back with Bill Hickey. This is Bill Hickey, the fine television critic of The Plain Dealer. We're talking about talk shows. And uh, when I first started to watch television, I didn't have one because I didn't have enough money to get one. And sometimes Bud Burka would invite us to his house, and we saw a most unusual nighttime program uh, that had Steve Allen on it. I guess that was the original Tonight Show. Oh, yeah. And I, there he was, and I thought that was just fabulous stuff. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, I don't think Steve has really ever been given credit. He was the first one to really make that late-night viewing hum. You know, he was a funny, marvelous, creative man. The marvelous sense of humor. His laugh alone, you know, was so infectious. And the talent he had on that show. Think of Edie Gourmet and Andy Williams, and of course, Edie's husband. I can't even think of his name at the moment. Steve Lawrence. It's too early. Steve Lawrence. <laughs> and Pat Marshall. He had four singers, of course. And they did marvelous, creative things. Remember the open door? Yes. And he'd go out and nail people yeah. on the street. Or, uh, Steve Lawrence would do his drunk act, go staggering mm -hmm. by. They always had shtick going. It was a great show, just a great show. It was uh, uh, a really sort of version of Saturday Night Live, only with a little more class, perhaps. A great deal of class. He was always a classy guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and then, then he left, and who followed him? Then they staggered through that period. Remember America After Dark? Yeah. And but all those dreadful shows. And then here is and what then right, the man really happened. took it over. Right. NBC was right down the tubes, and they gave this guy a chance. And he, of course, went on to become a household word. He used to work right down the street here at WGAR. He did? Right? I oh, didn't yeah. know that. Right. This was his first big-time market, Cleveland. Parr was probably uh, the most fascinating man who ever worked that show. You never knew what he was going to do. This was the difference. Like Carson, you, you don't mind missing Carson. But Parr, you would just, if you missed a show, you know, he'd have someone do something and you regret it. Elsa Maxwell, Alexander King, he had fantastic Fabulous conversations. And they would say anything. Yeah. Outrageous mm -hmm. things. Oscar Levant. There he is again. Why didn't it work when he came back? You know, it's a funny thing. He almost thing. became a caricature of himself, didn't he? Absolutely. You know, that you can't go home again. You really can't. Um, you know, the first show he ever did when he came back, he came out, he was greeted, thunderous applause, and he was really clicking. And about 15 minutes into that, they said, Jack, we're going to have to stop the taping. We have no audio. And he went into a total funk. He never came out of it, you know. But really, it was, uh, and once a week, you can't establish any rapport with a national audience once yeah. a week, you know. Now, how about Johnny, Johnny Carson, who's been there for so long now? Um, what was uh, what was his, his strength initially? Do you think? 
Um, his main strength was and is a very quick wit. He is perhaps the quickest witted man I've ever seen. Um, and you know, he wears well for some reason. He's Aww. got that marvelous Midwestern face and manner about him. Well, that and his wit is so quick, so it's always on the spur of the moment. It's never rehearsed. It just sort of No, you, you just can't rehearse it. So. And uh, I've seen him do amazing things. There he is again. Oh. That look he's still got, except his hair has turned snow white here. Yes. Right? Well, yeah, See, he, he must have been around was about 38. And uh, he's been doing the henna rinse number for years now. And he stopped doing that. For the Grecian formula, or whatever it was. <laughs> you know. yeah. Now, uh, in the afternoon, we've had a, a kind of a different kind of program. The talk shows we typically see around in the afternoon are Merv and Dinah mm -hmm. and Mike Star Douglas. shows. You know, lots of stars. Right. Uh, you mentioned initially that those shows seem to be tapering off a little bit in their appeal. Is it that people have just become jaded with seeing the stars time and time and time again, telling about their next movie? I think so. You know, there are only so many stars, and there are only so many good talkers, and so many interesting people. And uh, when you see the same people doing the same shtick all the time, I think the average viewer becomes very jaded and very, uh, you know, so I all those shows, you know, like how many times can you see Lucy or on a Carson show, Hope, you can always know when he's going to have a special because he will be there, you know, that kind of stuff. And There's okay. Mike, with, with whom I don't know. I'm not sure I recognize that man. You know who that looks like before he went on his diet? Godfrey Gregory. Cambridge? Oh, oh Gregory. Yeah. You know, I, believe, I believe it does. That's he used to be a heavy set man. Yeah. Hmm. Then he started to run and eat nothing well, but he went on that fast. Nuts. Yeah. yeah. I don't well, know what was... year that photograph was taken. That looks like probably Philadelphia, <clears throat> because Mike was awfully young when he started that show. Yeah, and it would have to be at least 10 years ago. I mean, that's one of the great success stories of all time. You know what Mike was doing before he got that job? <laughs> he was singing in a bowling alley in Los Angeles. And it came down to Mike and Ronnie Barrett. And, and they imported yeah. the great out-of-town talent. And, uh, and then Ronnie subsequently went to Chicago and did a talk show for a while mm -hmm. that came on at midnight every night. Oh, yeah. Before Ronnie, he came back here. Uh, Ronnie was a good talk show host. What's going to happen next in talk shows, do you think? Uh, I think we're going to have a, a definite falling out of like a national talk show, you know, regionally or locally. Uh, there's a new one every day. Just look at our town. Yes, we got Sap across good the grief. way there. You know, every two minutes you've got another talk show mm -hmm. going, both on radio and on television. And uh, as I say, it's all going to come down to the personalities of the people involved. And uh, the guests are one of them. You know, one of the best talk shows this time ever had, in my opinion, was Don Robertson's crazy show on 25. It was open-ended. I was, was open on that show. I used to be on that show every now and again. And, you know, he did a great thing. Before he I was had, ever working here. And in the beginning, he confined his guests to Clevelanders, to people who were fairly well-known or sometimes little-known. But they were interesting people. And as long as he concentrated on that, he did very well. And then he went the way of all flesh, you know, the Hollywood star would be in town and he would be trying to get an interview and taping the show and uh, it became very disjointed. Um, talk shows will be here forever. You know, some awareness, you know, they've been on their 16th, 15th year, but there will always be talk shows. As long as we can have something fresh to talk about. And of course, even if it's not fresh, they, maybe uh, there's a new group of people who came along who didn't hear it before. <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> That's what we're counting on. <laughs> we're counting yeah, on. right? Hey, you know, this is our anniversary, so what advice would you have? You've seen every talk show that's come down the pike now since 1968, and you've studied it as a student. What advice would you give the morning exchange to keep it on the air Well, Jackie Gleason has always said you never tamper with a myth, and you guys have a myth going here. Whatever you've done, you've done right, so don't tamper with it. It's that simple. And you mean, don't fire any of the three of us, right? <laughs> oh, no, no. No, that Joel you Rose, would do. maybe, maybe. But, uh, no, I wouldn't touch it. Just <laughs> let it roll. Gee, Bill, I'm going to call you See, and then the people will discover you in 10 or 20 years, and you'll all be out of work. <laughs> Bill, thanks so much for coming down. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. you. I just wish I were awake. It would have been much more fun. <laughs> Bill Hickey from The Plain Dealer. We're going to uh, reminisce a little bit. We've... Uh, found a few little pieces of tape here and there and some films from the early days of the show. We'll take a look at some of those right after Joel does the news. And here he is. <laughs> Thank you. What's his name? And uh, good morning again, everybody. It is cold out there. It is so cold. No, you know, it's one of those. 
Uh, it's so cold, in fact, that the school buses wouldn't start out in the uh, Willoughby East Lake area this morning, so add them to your list of places where school ain't today. Uh, the only other school closing we have reported is the kindergarten in the Madison schools, and uh, they are not open today, but everybody else is supposed to be there. And the forecast for the rest of the day uh, doesn't look too bright. It's going to be continued cloudy, windy, and cold with a uh, high probably somewhere around 10 or 12 degrees today. According to one of the men who supposedly knows the state of the Cleveland Police Department very well, we should all be deeply concerned as of this Friday. That's when the mayor's announced layoffs will go into effect, 400 people to be laid off, including 275 policemen. Mayor Dennis Kucinich laid the facts out on the line. And minutes later, police union president Bill McNay laid it on the line as to what's in store for Cleveland residents. If I were the citizens, I'd have deep concern. Uh, they keep saying that they're going to maintain the same amount of services. There's no way. Anybody with common sense knows that they cannot maintain in an already understaffed police department attempt to maintain the same standard of services with 275 less people on the job. There's just no way. McNay also says his union will go to court now in hopes of blocking those layoffs. The layoffs had to happen in part because the city is unable to meet a $5 million payment to the state police and firemen's pension fund because of a restricted cash flow problem. City Finance Director Joe Tigreen says the city might be able to pay the debt later this month. He says it's a choice between meeting city payrolls or meeting the pension payments. What will happen if the pension fund payment is not met by the end of this month? Well, the state attorney general now says he'll place a lien against the city's 1979 city income tax receipts to make sure that they do get their money. Teachers in the Garfield Heights School District have now ratified a new three-year contract there, uh, thereby averting a strike that was scheduled to start later today. We'll have more after this.